Last time, we had the opportunity to learn more about Mesopotamian demons acting in groups. Now, we can turn to individual demons. Let's start with our famous Pazuzu. Pazuzu is a relatively young demon who appears only in Assyrian and Babylonian texts of the first millennium BCE. Pazuzu is the son of the infernal divinity Ghanbu and is considered to be the king of the demons by the Mesopotamians. As king of the demons, he has both a maleficent and beneficial aspect. As a wrongdoer, he may cause huge epidemics, but he may also be invoked against other demons, spirits or monsters, such as Lamashtu or the evil west wind. In that sense, he uses his royal authority to order a demon to withdraw from his victim and return to his or her abode. It is this beneficial aspect that caused Mesopotamians to put amulets with his effigy in the foundations or on the walls of houses. A statuette of his head was traditionally hung around the neck of female victims of Lamashtu, a female demon this time. This Lamashtu is the second demon discussed here. Despite the major role of Pazuzu in modern times due to the American film industry, as we have seen in the previous unit, the most frightening demon in the eyes of the Mesopotamian is actually Lamashtu, who already appears in text from the 3rd millennium BCE. Originally, Lamashtu was the daughter of the god of heaven, Anu, and the sister of the goddess of love, Ishtar, but when she demanded to have meat for food, she was expelled from heaven. As a result, Lamashtu had to find her food herself, and out of rage, she started to fight against the divine order by attacking innocent people, especially pregnant women, young mothers and young children. Taking into account the high child mortality rate in ancient Mesopotamia, one can easily understand the great fear inspired by this demon. In certain cases, however, Lamashtu could also attack adults and even older people. Lamashtu usually disguises herself as a midwife to access her victims, whom she subsequently tries to kill by strangulation or by using poisoned milk. Symptoms of her unpleasant presence are fever, diarrhea, loss of appetite, abdominal distension, jaundice, and typhoid fever. Lamashtu is an individual demon with a specific iconography and history. In incantations, Lamashtu is described as possessing the head of a lion, the teeth of a donkey, bare breasts and a hairy body, blood-stained hands with long fingers and nails, and the clawed, talon-like feet of an eagle. She always appears in private religion, never in the official state religion. That's why we have many incantations against her, as well as amulets borne by the people around their neck and inscribed with incantations against her. Such amulets could also be placed in the corner of houses to prevent Lamashtu from entering. Along with some specific rituals, these incantations are the principal means to fight this horrible demon. The ritual basically goes as follows. Three statuettes of Lamashtu are placed near the sick person. Then, the first statuette is burned, the second is sent to the netherworld through the desert, and the third one is pierced with a needle. The ritual is accompanied by the recitation of incantations. Note also that Lamashtu sometimes acted together with two acolytes, Labatsu, who causes fever, and Akazu, who makes the body turn yellow and the tongue black. But this is not the only demonic triad in Mesopotamian beliefs. There is also the triad Lilu, Lilitu, and Ardat Lili, again already attested in Sumerian texts from the third millennium. Originally storm demons, they became demons of the night that merged with men and women while they were asleep. Lilu and Lilitu, his female equivalent, have no husband or wife, so they are always looking for a partner. Lilu is a winged demon who assaults women, especially pregnant women. Lilitu is less known, 
and the distinction between her and Ardat Lili is often unclear. In any case, only in later texts does Ardat Lili explicitly appear as the third member of this demon family. Ardat Lili is described as an unsatisfied virgin who has never known the pleasures of love and who represents virgins who died before having the chance to marry or have children. To compensate for this, she attacks young men and tries to marry them or to break their marriage. But she also attacks young women of a marriageable age in order to subdue them to their own desire. Occasionally, she even is in search of babies to eat. Once attacked by one of these three demons, the unfortunate victim will never find a partner again. Incidentally, and in all likelihood, Ardat Lili is the prototype of the female demon Lilith of the Hebrew Bible, a book that does not only talk about the angels, but also about the demons, even if that topic cannot be dealt with in any further in this course. Two other demons are Nemtar and Samanu. Nemtar is a special one, as is both venerated as an earthly god, the personification of death, and fear as a demon, in text from the 2nd millennium BCE. As a god, is only attested in lists of gods and in some mythological texts, while, as a demon, is mentioned exclusively in incantations. Is the vizier of Eresh Kigal, the divine queen of the netherworld. In his function as a demon, is especially known as a bringer of mortal disease. In the Atrachasis Deluge myth, an Akkadian epic written down in the 17th century BCE, he must, on the command of the god Enlil, terrorize humanity with various illnesses and plagues. He is always associated with plagues and misfortune, and his description as the great demon of the grave makes his intentions clear. So he was, to say the least, very dangerous. Its mouth was filled with poison, and according to the ancient text, his clothes were symbolically made of fear and terror. The last individual demon to be discussed is Samanu, who was originally a secondary god of the city of Lagash. In the first half of the second millennium BCE, the old Babylonian period, however, he appears as a demon attacking infants, young boys and prostitutes. There are no graphic depictions of him, but in text, he is described as having the mouth of a lion, the teeth of a dragon, the wings of an eagle and the tail of a scorpion. In Mesopotamia, demons were generally dealt with by a combination of rituals, amulets and incantations. In Mesopotamian tradition, three types of specialists were authorized to make diagnosis of a demonic, demonic presence and to execute such ritual acts in order to expel the demon. They are the Ashipu, which is a specialist in incantations, the Asu, a kind of physician, and the Baru, who was a specialist in interpreting divine omina. We hope the demons of these two videos haven't frightened you as much as they frightened the ancient Mesopotamians. In the next video, we will move back to the world of monotheism and we will see that demons are far from forgotten there. For instance, in Coptic Christianity, in Egypt, the fight between good and evil is very much expressed in terms of a fight against demon, demons or unclean spirits. So stay with us to find out more. Mm -hmm.